Networking it is a skill that is considered to be crucial in the games industry, but it is also a skill that some of us find kind of difficult. Whether it is because we are a little introverted or because we have neurological disabilities, that make networking quite impossible. In this talk, I'm going to list some of the approaches to networking that have helped make it a little less daunting for me, talk about some of the safety concerns that exist with networking as a neurodivergent person, and talk about some potential ways to make networking more accessible for us. So, to briefly introduce myself, I have autism, which is a neurological condition that affects many things. It affects my social skills. My mannerisms and sense of social cues are quite different from a neurotypical person. It is like I'm in a play with a bunch of people and I was given the wrong script. So when it comes to actually performing, I have to improvise based on what the other actors are doing. As you can imagine, this makes networking quite difficult. It also affects my senses. Autistic people are bad at filtering out irrelevant stimuli. If there is a clock making a ticking noise, my brain will treat that as important as, important as whoever I'm trying to have a conversation with in a given moment. So if you put me in a room with hundreds of other people who are all yelling over each other, it is genuinely agonizing. As you can imagine, this makes networking quite difficult. I also have really bad social anxiety, the sort where if I need to ask a shopkeeper for help, I might cry afterwards. And as you can imagine, that makes networking quite difficult. I don't say this as a really bad attempt at being relatable. I say this to introduce the baggage that I carry on with me every time I go networking. This is the stuff that I have to contend with. So here are a few approaches that have helped me with networking. I do quickly want to mention a couple of things first though. Firstly, none of this advice is going to make networking easy. It is still going to be quite difficult, but hopefully it will make it a little bit easier. Secondly, as we are all different, even those of us with the same disabilities, as they say in the autistic community, if you've met one autistic person, you have met one autistic person. <laughs> These tips might not work for you, but they are still things that you can try and hopefully they will help. One of the main tips that I have for a neurodivergent person going to networking events is to bring a friend and there are several reasons why. First of all, it gives you an extra incentive to actually go. Um, I find that if I don't have someone coming with me, the temptation to just stay home and watch Netflix is sometimes too strong. Um, if your friend is socially confident, they can help sneak you into conversations. It can be a great way to be introduced to people if you're not comfortable making those introductions yourself. If your friend is not good in social situations, you could just end up spending the entire evening with them. And while this is not necessarily productive if your goal is meeting new people, speaking from personal experience, it is a lot less miserable than spending the entire evening by yourself huddling in a corner somewhere. And lastly, if something bad happens, there will be at least one person present who can help. Um, panic attacks, meltdowns, and all that fun stuff are a very real risk at networking events. And um, it actually can save you in some circumstances. In G GDC 2019, my first GDC, I was almost assaulted. And the only reason I wasn't was because I had a friend with me who noticed what was going on and got me out of that situation. So for safety alone, bring a friend with you when you go networking. Another thing that helps for me is try to predict when an event will be at its least busy and network then. Standalone events like treat and greet will usually be at their busiest in the middle. Some people will arrive early, some people will be late, but very few people are going to stay the entire time. Post meetup networking events such as a trip to the pub after a conference will be busy pretty much immediately, so it might be a better idea to just wait an hour or two before coming along. And remember that you can leave an event and come back. What I will occasionally do is show up for the first half hour, and then once it gets busy, I will leave. I will go for a walk, get a curry, do something enjoyable that will pass some time. And once it's quieter again, I will come back. And the best part is the people that are there will be different from those who were there earlier. If the venue that you're at has an outdoor section, try to do your networking there. It is much quieter, so it should be less overwhelming for anybody that has sensory processing difficulties. And it is also an environment that is much easier to leave if you need to. So if you feel a panic attack coming on or just something comes up, you can just walk out. Um, my advice is not going to work for everyone, as we are all very different people and as such all have very different needs. My approach to networking has been a result of thinking about what it is that I struggle with 
and trying out different methods of mitigating these struggles. Don't be afraid to try different ways of networking. So for instance, I struggle to be in noisy environments. So I network in an outdoor section of the venue if it has one. Now, networking is not always the safest activity and there are a few things to keep in mind, especially if you're a neurodivergent person when you go networking. For anybody that has sensory difficulties or anxiety, stick close to an entrance. This means that it is really easy to leave if anything happens or if an event is just really not suitable for you. I've had panic attacks in networking events. It is really unpleasant, but it is always far worse if you're surrounded by loads of strangers. Squeezing past swarms of people while frantically trying to find an exit because you're staving off a meltdown. It sucks. It really sucks. So staying near an entrance will help you avoid the situation because it means you can just leave if you need to. It is really important that you don't overdo it with networking and going to events. Going too hard in the short term means meltdowns. Going too hard in the long term means burnout. I get that it is really easy to get caught up in doing everything because game dev has a real hustle culture, one that encourages doing as much as you can. And just this is a really bad idea. So if you're really not up to going to an event, it is for the best that you stay home. And if you're feeling unwell at an event, it's probably for the best that you leave. There will be more opportunities in the future. Self-care is more important than going to everything. Now, <laughs> not everyone in games is a good person and a lot of disabled people may not have had conversations about how to stay safe in party type situations. I didn't until I was solidly in my 20s. Um, here are a few things that are good to know before you go networking. I do want to make it clear first though that if someone assaults you or anything like that, it is not your fault because you weren't careful enough or whatever mm -hmm. other victim blaming garbage people will come up with. It is solely the fault of the person who assaulted you. So one thing to be mindful of as a neurodivergent person is love bombing, which is the act of sharing someone with affection and attention as a manipulation tactic to win their trust. It is especially effective on socially isolated people, like a lot of neurodivergent people are. So if someone is trying to be too nice and trying to get you to trust them a bit too hard, it could be a sign that they are after something from you, so be careful around them. Also, people do get drugged at networking events, so be sure to grab your own drinks and don't drink from anything that is either already open or that you haven't actively been watching. If you feel really drunk and it either on set really quickly, like within 10 to 15 minutes, or if you have had very little alcohol, it is possible that a drink has been spiked, so seek a friend or an event organizer immediately. Avoid being alone with people you don't really know. If someone is trying to isolate you from people, it is a pretty big red flag. So if you're with a friend and someone is trying to separate the two of you, be careful around that person. And um, you have bodily autonomy. I know a lot of neurodivergent people struggle with this, but if someone is not respecting that by insisting on giving you hugs or anything like that when you've made it clear that you are not comfortable with that, you don't have to go through with that. The other person is acting poorly. And lastly, if someone is rude to you because of your disability or frankly because you're part of any minority group, it doesn't matter what games they've worked on or what awards they've won, it is not worth knowing that person and they are not worth wasting your time on. And um, here are a few ways that I believe we can make networking easier for neurodivergent people. Some of this is to do with how we structure events, but some of this is also how we interact with and relate to the people that we meet. So the harsh sensory stimuli that is present at networking events such as loud noises and constant bodily contact um, can be debilitating for a lot of neurodivergent people. And one way to make networking more accessible for us would be to minimize these conditions. So we can network without potentially harming ourselves. Here are a few ways that this can be done. First of all, you could reduce the number of people present at the event, which would both reduce noise levels and reduce crowding. You could also have no background music as this acts as another noise source in an already grueling environment. And it is simply something else that people have to yell over, making the event even louder. And hold events in places that are away from other noise sources. Plenty of networking events are held in places like pubs where there is already a lot of noise because of other patrons. 
Networking online is much easier for a lot of neurodivergent people for a number of reasons, but it is usually seen as a lesser version of networking by neurotypical people. For one thing, it is less overwhelming because you are not trying to interact with people while dealing with hundreds of others being in the same room, and there is also less of a focus on mannerisms and expressions, which helps free ourselves up to worry about what people are actually saying, rather than trying to hide the fact that we are disabled. One platform for online networking that has worked really well for me is the Games Industry Gathering, or GIG. They run events every Saturday where you are placed in Zoom calls with four to five other people from the games industry. I find that the structure surrounding the event is really helpful at preventing any awkwardness around figuring out how to start conversations. And the fact that I am not having to deal with the sensory overload of in-person events makes it a far more bearable way for me to network. For anyone looking at joining GIG, just bear in mind that they do only accept people that are in the industry, and this does not include students. One thing I worry about networking online, though, is whether online networking will events as we know them now will still be around after the pandemic. I understand the benefits of in-person events. It means I get to see friends that I don't get to see often. But I also do worry that if we go back to exclusively holding our events in person, we will lose the accessibility gains to disabled people or just people who are too poor to spend lots of money traveling that being online provided. We have frameworks for running events and conferences and stuff like that online now. Let's keep some of that around after the pandemic. Neurodivergent people get trust and ostracized for showing symptoms of their disabilities. A lot of us have learned since childhood how to hide them in a process that is called masking. The problem with masking is that it's exhausting because there is a lot of complexity in human behavior that neurotypical people perform instinctively, whereas we don't. To give an example, eye contact. It's a behavior that is far more complex than people give credit to. I don't naturally look at people's eyes when I talk to them and some people interpret that as me not being interested in what they have to say or that I'm being deceitful. The problem is it isn't as easy as just looking at people's eyes because people only look at hold eye contact 50 to 70% of the time. So I have to remember to look away from people, look back at people, and I have to do that on top of everything else involved in having a conversation. It would be so much easier to network if we didn't have to worry about driving people away by being ourselves. Someone with ADHD bouncing from topic to topic or an autistic person speaking with a reasonably flat effect. These aren't qualities that should be shunned. These are the quirks that make us human and individuals. Navigating through game development spaces can be very difficult, especially for neurodivergent people. Hopefully some of what I've discussed today helps networking feel a little easier and hopefully talking about how hard it can be for us will help the industry realize that we should make an effort to make it more accessible. If you're planning, if you're a neurodivergent and are planning to go to the treat and greet tonight, then I hope you enjoy yourself and you get a lot of the event. But if you decide not to, then good on you for practicing self-care and remembering that there will be more opportunities to network in the future. And thank you. Thank you.